G'day everyone, and welcome to one of the occasional explainers that I post on my Legal Education YouTube channel when there are cases that enter the public consciousness and where public discussion of those cases does not, in my view, give people a real opportunity to understand what actually happened in the case. On the 28th of April 2021, Richard Paul Pusey was convicted and sentenced in the County Court of Victoria. The circumstances of his offending were distressing and outrageous. He was pulled over for speeding in his Porsche motor vehicle on the side of the Eastern Freeway in Melbourne. He has accepted that he was speeding at 149 kilometres an hour in a 100 zone. After he was pulled over, he complied with police directions, gave samples of his breath and saliva, and police were discussing whether to impound his vehicle. While police were performing their duties, he excused himself to urinate a little way off the road. While he was away from the vehicles, a semi-trailer driven by a man named Mahinda Singh, who was fatigued and under the influence of drugs, collided with the police vehicles, with Mr Pusey's vehicle, and with the four police officers. All four of those officers ultimately died from their injuries, sustained while they were performing their duties for the protection of the public. Mr Singh was tw sentenced to 22 years in prison for those deaths. Mr Pusey's reaction was extraordinary. Instead of stopping to help the police or to assist a doctor who was on the scene, and instead of even dialing triple zero, he retrieved his phone and a lunchbox containing a small quantity of drugs and then began walking around the scene taking video and photo footage while maintaining a voice commentary expressing his amazement at what he'd seen. The voice commentary, and in particular the statement that this was justice, could certainly have been interpreted as criticising the police who lay dying. At the very least, his video and photo footage was voyeuristic and disgusting. Mr Pusey was charged with three offences, reckless conduct endangering persons, which was basically a serious speeding charge, outraging public decency and drug possession. He was ultimately sentenced to 10 months in prison, which basically meant with time served that he would be released within a few days of sentencing. Public reaction to Mr Pusey's sentence was very strong, the argument being that it was completely inadequate for the offending. In this video, I want to make it clear that I am personally appalled at the behaviour of Mr Pusey and that I have the greatest admiration for the police officers who put their safety on the line every day and every night to keep us safe. I'm going to try to explain the sentence, but please don't misinterpret this explanation as being either an endorsement or a minimisation of the outrageous nature of the conduct. The question many people are asking is how the judge came to such a figure. When a judge is sentencing, the starting point is always the maximum sentence which has been established by the Parliament. So on the reckless endangerment charge, the maximum penalty was five years in prison. On the drug charge, the maximum penalty was one year in prison. And on the charge of outraging public decency, there was no maximum penalty, because this is a traditional charge which has developed over the centuries of the common law. It's a charge that's not actually written down in any statute. The maximum penalty for each offence is the penalty which would be applied in the worst possible case for that offending. This can be a difficult concept to grab hold of because all criminal offending is pretty bad. But even in relation to a particular charge, there can be a spectrum of culpability. For instance, if you think about theft, someone stealing because they're starving is committing the same offence as someone who steals because they're envious that they can't afford that iPhone. Same charge, but quite different behaviour. So what the courts do is to compare the current offending with a range of previous cases where that same offence has been charged. The objective is to try to get consistency. Straight away, though, there's a difficulty doing this on the charge of outraging public decency. Most of the time in the past, this charge has been applied as a traditional version of our modern indecent exposure charge. So it has usually involved people publicly displaying their genitals. 
That sort of behaviour really doesn't help the court to measure the seriousness of Pusey's behaviour. The only case the court could find which was even remotely similar to this case was one in the UK called the Crown and Anderson, where the defendant saw a woman fall over in the street at night. And instead of rendering assistance or calling for help, he threw water over her, then covered her in shaving cream, then urinated on her while recording it on his phone. During all of this, she died because she had in fact collapsed from pancreatic failure. He received three years in prison. Now, I think that without for a moment excusing Pusey, most people would say that Anderson's behaviour, spraying shaving cream on a dying woman and urinating on her, was objectively worse than Pusey's behaviour. Both were awful, but Anderson's was worse. After considering comparative cases, the next step for the court is to consider a range of what are called sentencing factors. Each of these sentencing factors tends to press the court either towards increasing or decreasing the penalty. The judge in Pusey's case considered a number of factors which tend to press towards a higher sentence. Two of those were what we call general deterrence and denunciation. General deterrence says that the sentence should make other people think twice before they behave in the same way. Denunciation is a formal way for the court to say that the community does not tolerate or accept the behaviour of the offender. The judge considered denunciation to be paramount in this case, saying that Pusey's behaviour was heartless, cruel and disgraceful. Another factor pressing towards a heavier sentence was specific deterrence, which is the idea that a sentence should make an individual offender think twice before offending again. Now, Pusey had a criminal history, including a previous charge for reckless endangerment, so it was necessary for specific deterrence to be given substantial weight. And of course, underlying that was the reality that if Pusey had not driven his vehicle so quickly and recklessly, the police officers would not have been there in that place at that time, and they would not have been killed. That doesn't make Pusey responsible for the killing, but it's not irrelevant either. Then there are a range of sentencing factors that tend to suggest a lighter punishment. The first of these was Mr Pusey's plea of guilty. Guilty pleas play an important role in our system of justice. For one thing, a plea of guilty shows remorse, especially in a case like this where the plea is not just accepting the inevitable, because this really was an unusual use of the charge of outraging public decency, and had he contested it, he might well have been acquitted. But it would have taken years to make its way through the courts, and the poor families of those police would have had to live with the process dragging up their grief over and over. The guilty plea is hardly noble, but it did save the families and the witnesses that additional distress. Guilty people are encouraged to plead guilty because there is a sentencing discount reflecting all of this. Second, the court is allowed to consider what is called extracurial punishment. Extracurial just means outside the court. The idea is that when a person has suffered consequences from their offending, lawfully or unlawfully, the court can consider those consequences when framing the sentence. Pusey was the focus of inflammatory media attention, including the false allegation that he had mocked and denigrated the officers who lay dying. He received threats, his family were threatened and attacked, his house was damaged, and he was attacked by prison guards. No doubt, we can understand why some of those people reacted as they did. But by punishing him themselves, they placed the court in the position where the court had to consider reducing the formal sentence to take account of that. Third, where a person has been in jail pending their sentencing, so when they've been on remand, their conditions in prison can be considered. A person who's in a minimum security environment is still suffering a removal of their liberty but they're having an entirely different experience to a person who's in protective maximum security custody or who's in solitary confinement for their own protection. In this case, the court acknowledged that Pusey had been in jail at a time when all prisoners were doing harder time than usual due to COVID lockdowns. And then on top of that, he had been in protective custody and on suicide watch. While he was inside, his brother died and he'd been unable to attend the funeral. 
The final thing the court had to consider was Mr Pusey's psychological condition. The court had him assessed and the diagnosis was that he had a number of personality-related issues, which would require substantial commitment to therapy if they were to be overcome. What this meant to the judge was that a substantial period of parole or probation would be necessary because a person in the community on parole or probation can be forced to attend therapy. If they don't, they can be returned to jail or returned before the court. If a person just does their time in jail and then walks out, they can thumb their nose at any demands that they participate in therapy. So Pusey's prospects of rehabilitation were best if a fair portion of his sentence was to be suspended in some way. So the judge had to start with the maximum penalties, reduce them by comparing them to the sentences imposed for other similar offending in the past, expand that for general deterrence, denunciation and specific deterrence, then reduce it to take account of the guilty plea, the extracurial punishment, the nature of the time spent in prison and the prospects of rehabilitation. The judge has to somehow magically coalesce all of this into a single sentence. In this case, the judge sentenced him to eight months in prison on the reckless endangerment charge. So that was actually considered to be the more significant charge because that was the behaviour that led to the deaths of the police officers. He was sentenced to three months imprisonment for outraging public decency, but only one month could be served concurrently with the reckless endangerment sentence. The other two months got added to the eight months to produce an ultimate sentence of 10 months in prison, starting from the date he was originally placed on remand. Crucially, the judge also sentenced him on the drug charge to a two-year bond, under which he must participate in the counselling, which will hopefully help him to overcome his personality disorders and reduce the chances of his offending again. Now look, high-profile cases like this often go on appeal and it wouldn't surprise me if this one was appealed. So the sentence may change. Some of you, having heard my explanation, might be satisfied with the sentence. Others of you, inevitably, will still be outraged. I'm not going to try to convince you either way. But I do hope this video gives you a lot more understanding of how the sentence was reached compared to the appallingly shallow, inflammatory, uninformed commentary we get in the media. I want to finish by once again paying my respects to the four police officers and their families. No sentence can bring those officers back into the community, but the community's gratitude for their diligent performance of their duties and their ultimate sacrifice is very clear.